HR issues can kill you. One complaint against your company can turn your world upside down. And you spend way too much time dealing with HR when you should be spending your time on making a profit. You should talk to Bambi. With Bambi, get access to your own dedicated U.S.-based HR manager starting at just $99 per month. They get to know you and your business while providing HR expertise and the personal touch you need and want. They're available by phone, email, and real-time chat, so onboarding and terminations run smoothly. Team members reach peak performance, and your business stays compliant with changing HR regulations. And with Bambi's HR Autopilot, you'll automate important HR practices like setting policies, training, and feedback. HR managers can easily cost 80 grand a year, but Bambi starts at $99 per month. Schedule your free conversation today to see how much Bambi can take off your plate. Go to Bambi.com right now and type in Accelerate under podcast when you sign up. It'll really help the show. Spelled BAM, B-E-E dot com. Bambi.com. Type in Accelerate. Welcome to Accelerate Your Business Growth, where we're exploring all sorts of business topics. Experts from around the world join me, your host, Diane Helbig, for a conversation where they share their expertise with all of you. Take what you need, when you need it. Featured on Inc.com, Forbes, and MSNBC's Your Business, this podcast is recognized as one of the best podcasts for small business, sales, leadership, social media, and more. When it comes to business, Accelerate Your Business Growth has got it covered. And now on with the show. My guest today is Charlie Locke. Charlie is a sales leadership expert who, in 2020, teamed up with community building expert Michael Gagliano to build the only dedicated community for sales development reps in the world called SDR Nation. After 20 years in software sales, both knew that something had to be done to bridge the huge enablement gap that exists in sales. Now, managers and sales leaders will learn how to nurture the talent within their teams. And Charlie will be telling us later about this new gig he's got going on um, with Circle. But in the meantime, we are going to be talking today about this whole you know, how do you build a good team, a good, you know, SDR team and uh, make sure they have the tools and resources they need, reduce turnover, all all sorts of really important um, topics, especially these days where it is so challenging to find people who will stay, who will show up and then stay. So, and be successful. (laughs) Uh, thanks so much for joining me today, Charlie. No, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Absolutely. So I, I, I want to start with uh, this whole stigma that seems to exist around sales. And I'm wondering, um, I mean, my first question is really, do you believe there's still a stigma? And if so, how, how you know, what is the challenge that it presents for SDRs? It's a great question. <clears throat> and when you say stigma, I'm going to assume you mean the stigma of a salesperson being sort of untrustworthy, a yes. little, little bit greasy, um, <laughs> that kind of a thing. <laughs> yes, I, I do believe there's still a stigma in sales. And the reason I say that is because we're still not seeing post-secondary education in sales. And one of the reasons why I think that's the case is because parents, the buyers of education, for the most part, um, still consider it to be not a real profession. You know, when they were growing up, perhaps, um, you know, their, their, their peers and friends that got into sales, they weren't necessarily considered to be, you know, the most academically inclined. They were good talkers, you know, always a good talker, yeah. a good sales guy, you know, that's kind of the role you go into. And so that stigma is still in a lot of people's minds that sales isn't a profession. The reality is over the last 20 years, now tenured salespeople make more money than doctors, lawyers, engineers, architects, all these professional careers that, you know, were considered to be the ones that, you know, you'd want your kid to go down, but post-secondary education hasn't caught up. 
And I think a big part of that reason for that shift in sales becoming more of a professional career path has been with the really the pro proliferation of cloud technology and, um, and cloud computing that happened in the late 90s, where all of a sudden some of these tech companies had a lot more money to play with. They didn't actually have any cost of goods. They didn't have to ship any hardware, any software anymore. And you have a lot of more margin to play with. And they said, well, what are you going to do with all this money? Well, why don't we reinvest it back in sales? And they started turning this art into a science. And so this career has turned much more into a science over the last 20 years. But in many cases, the stigma is still very much alive. And for that reason, there's most, no, no post-secondary degree in sales. It's very little sales training. So if you're looking to hire a salesperson and it's their first, perhaps, job, it's very unlikely they've never sold before. And it is a science and it is an art as well, but it puts a really tough challenge on small business owners because um, you have to do all the training and enablement yourselves. Um, so anyways, that's one piece of it. To your question around the stigma in the actual sales process with buyers, 100%, you know, buyers now have way more information than they used to have, you know, with, with the internet. And buyers, you know, when you go to buy a car, you used to go 20 years ago, you go buy a car, you go to the dealer and you'd go talk to the salesperson. Now, when you buy a car, <clears throat> you research everything online. You go to all the review sites, you go to all the groups and, um, and then you look at the five dealers that you want to buy from and you maybe play them against each other. You pick the car before you even step foot a lot. And so the job of a salesperson now is way different. It's, it's much more about building trust and less so about education on the product itself. And, um, and, and because of that, it's even more important for salespeople to really build trust with people quickly um, to, to get over that stigma. And it's so challenging because they're, they're not being trained that way yet. Mm -hmm. I feel like they're still being trained the old way that doesn't work. I agree, yeah. Yeah, the, uh, the, the old way is um, get your product information out in front of the buyer as quickly as possible and see if they bite. Yeah. And, um, and, and, and then use perhaps manipulation techniques to get them into an engagement where, to your point, it just doesn't work. And, and buyers are, like, like I said, smarter than they were before and more educated than they were before. And there's really no reason for them to bite because they can get most of the information online anyways. So you're right. It is just simply a, a tactic that doesn't work. And so, you know, what I train a lot in SDR nation is how to, how to learn about your customer's pain and how to really empathize with that pain and speak to their pain and, and, and build a, a conversation around that pain or, or, you know, that, or that goal that they want. Um, and that's where the conversation was, should reside rather than spewing your product features and, and pitching them on um, outcomes that aren't, aren't likely. Right. Okay. So given that the stigma still exists and that, it, you know, th this is not taught in secondary education and we do have people entering this field without any sort of education in how to be successful initially, how does a sales manager or a business owner reduce turnover of those folks? Yeah, um, <clears throat> well, I think first and foremost, the way I think of turnover or when someone leaves the business, whether it's voluntarily or not voluntarily, i.e. you fired them or they left on their own, one of two things went wrong. Um, especially if, you know, they're not performing well and, you know, you have to let them go. When you let someone go, it's never that person's fault. Either you hired the wrong person or you didn't train them properly, simply put. Um, so that's the first shift in mindset you need to make as a business owner or a small business owner or a sales leader is that this is 100% in your control and it's 100% on your shoulders and you need to own it. Either you hired the wrong person or you didn't train them properly. And <clears throat> so thinking through that lens, a lot of it really comes down to, did you hire the right person? And do you have a good hiring methodology for making sure you're hiring 
good salespeople and especially young salespeople, like I said, that don't have a lot of experience, you're not going to be hiring as much for experience. What have you done already today? I don't hire that. I don't care that much if someone's sold in my industry or has done the job that I'm hiring for before. In a lot of cases, I actually see that as a bit of a red flag. Um, they're not typically as malleable. They're not as coachable. Um, they uh, maybe have been you know, trained poor behaviors from some other manager. Um, or if they're looking to get into a, let's call it um, horizontal move to get into a sales role that I'm hiring for, why are they doing that? Like, why are they leaving their current company? If they're a top performer, they're probably going to stay at that company because they're more likely to get promoted faster there than they would by coming over to my company. So I'm typically not looking for people that are actually doing the job that I'm hiring for because it means they're usually not a high performer. Not in all cases, but that's typically the case. So I hire for characteristics and behaviors that I've seen in all the successful salespeople I've ever worked with. And a lot of these come from some books that I've read that I've, you know, put into practice from a hiring perspective, but then seeing how it's come into play when I've actually hired the folks like this. And some of those things, number one on that list, and you'll hear a lot of great sales leaders talk about this is curiosity. You know, sales is about listening. It's not about talking. It's about, you know, marketers talk. That's their job. Marketers job is to tell people, educate them, bring them down the funnel with awareness. Our job is to then pull them the last little bit down the funnel by really doing some discovery and asking some key questions about what they really want. And does this solution actually align to what they really want and their hopes and dreams and we're solving their biggest problems and aligning all of that to your solution. And so if you don't have a curious minded salesperson, they're never going to stop and simply just ask a little bit more questions and ask a layering questions of like, Oh, that's interesting that you said that. Why is that the case? So that's number one is curiosity. Number two is, is, is coachability. You know, I'm not just looking for people that can do what I tell them to do. I don't really want that. I want people who are really self-aware and really comfortable and um, are comfortable exposing their own weakness and looking at their weaknesses as well. And so, um, because those are the salespeople that tend to not have that stigma, tend to not be greasy, tend to not be untrustworthy because they're extremely comfortable with looking at themselves through a lens of, I have got some flaws and that's okay. Um, And when they have that humility, they bring that humility to a sales conversation as well. And so I look for people that are really coachable. It means they're self-aware, they're diagnosing their flaws and they're bringing those areas of challenge to me as a leader and saying, hey, I'm struggling with this and this and this. I've tried A and B, I can't figure it out. What do you think now? Rather than the person that comes to me and just says, tell me what to do. Um, so those are, you know, these are things that behaviors and characteristics, and there's a few more that I, I, I tend to lean on as well. Work ethic is a big one. I just look for folks that, you know, that grew up working in a lot of ways, you know, um, cause there's a lot of kids out of school now that never worked before. And so when the times get tough, they don't know what to do. They, 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 you know, I, there's a lot of shovel sharpeners out there rather than diggers, I'd call it where, you know, you know, the path out or the solution is to just dig the hole, but they like to look at their shovel and figure out if they've got the right one and how sharp it would be when, when sometimes you just got to dig. And so those are some key behaviors and characteristics that I've seen in extremely successful salespeople in in my career. And that's where I would say you should start as a sales leader is, is in your hiring and making sure you're bringing in people with these, you know, great qualities uh, that make great salespeople. I think that is so great. So there's there's so much there that that I like. I think the first thing is that you don't necessarily want to hire someone who's already selling in the industry because if they're, as you said, if they're looking for something else, there's a good chance that it's because they're not very good at accomplishing the goal. That it really does start with who are you hiring? And we have to be very careful about hiring just to get a butt in a seat, you know, a, a warm mm-hmm. body, because it, it it's more expensive than taking the time to really get those folks who have the skills and the characteristics that are going to help them be successful, which is ultimately what we're looking for. It's really, it's great. And you I love it. the curiosity thing. I mean, I'm all about that. I, I agree with you. I think sales is mostly about listening and about curiosity and then connecting 
and I don't think enough people are embracing that idea. Yeah, I mean, I think they they probably proliferate that idea of the stigma of like, well, I just got to, it's a necessary evil. It's got to hire that, yep. you know, uh, untrustworthy, yeah. talkative, <laughs> um, you know, uh, maybe relationship builder, you know, they're all, they're good with people. They can sort of strike up a conversation with anyone. Like, I don't care <laughs> if you're, um, I mean, obviously there's rapport and, you know, likability is important in sales, but Think about the people you like when you go to a party. Do you like the person yeah. that tells you all about them all day long, all night long, yeah. and tells you how great they are and talks about themselves the whole time? Yeah. Or do you like the person who asks you questions about your life and wants to get to know you even deeper? Those are the people you tend to remember. Like, I want to get to know that person better next yeah. time. And it's just like, why, why, in, why in our human condition in, in, our, in our normal life do we think, this is the quality of the person person I want to connect with. But when it comes to sales, you want the person that you don't want to hang out with. Yeah, doesn't right. Yeah. <laughs> it just doesn't make any sense. So let's stop doing it. So, um, <laughs> I'm sorry, excuse me. Um, At this time, I'd like to take a sponsor break. The Accelerate Your Business Growth Podcast is happy to be sponsored by audible.com. And I'm sure you know that audible.com has thousands of audiobook titles to choose from, but you might not know about the other content. There's podcasts, Audible Originals, guided meditations. Uh, my favorite thing is to be able to listen to different kinds of things all on the same platform. I think it's a time saver uh, and it's like a productivity uh, hack for me. I don't have to go jumping from one platform to another. Uh, so we're offering you a free trial. You can go to audibletrial.com slash business growth, sign up for that free trial, and then explore on your own. You know, check out the audiobooks, check out the other programs, see what really, you know, resonates with you. Interested in getting some help with your sales strategy? Pick up a copy of Succeed Without Selling on Amazon or wherever books are sold. So are there tools that you think every sales development rep should have at their, you know, in their process in their toolbox? Yeah, I think, I mean, when I started in sales development, it was a long time ago, so I'm aging myself, but I had an Excel list of 4,000 names and phone numbers in a touchstone phone. Um, and that's, that was what it was 20 years ago. And, you know, since then, there's been all kinds of technology that's been introduced, which, which has made the job way easier. Um, we made, you know, humans way more efficient in the process and, and uh, allowed folks to do a lot more. I, I think before, you know, but it, what can happen with layer on layering on tools, especially too fast is that you just add a bunch of complexity to the process um, that makes it harder for you to train new reps, harder for that person just to start doing the job because they're always trying to figure out what, where they should go next and what buttons to click and things like that. So I, I'm a fan of, 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 you know, looking at your tools from the channels that you're going to be engaging with your prospects in. So those channels, you know, the common ones are the phone or email or social selling, you know, connecting with people over LinkedIn or Twitter or what have you. And, and, um, and, and you should really know those channels based on where your customers hanging out, where they're more likely to be consuming information and are, are more likely to engage with you um, because you either have their phone number or you can never find their phone number or they pick up the phone or they don't pick up the phone. Some people, you know, some it's actually, there's some interesting data around some roles, pick up the phone and some don't. Um, you know, if you're prospecting into bars or restaurants, which, you know, and a couple companies here, those restaurant managers are always on their phone nonstop. So they leverage texting, you know, quite a bit in their process. They don't really do emailing because those restaurant managers aren't sitting in a computer looking at their inbox all day. So, um, you know, those are things that you should think about are just what are the channels that you really want to engage with, with your customer and your prospect and, and what messaging do you want to get across? And once you have that, those foundational pieces nailed of your, you know, your, what their pains are, what their day-to-day -day looks like, what their, what messaging you want to have and what channels you want to deliver that messaging, then you start looking at the tools 
that you would you would leverage to to layer on top of it and um you know i i think the more common ones these days that people tend to look at are um are simply just around getting your data organized the the the, the prospect of having your SDRs find the lead data and then engage with them is a huge waste of money and time, I believe. You know, if you can't buy your lead data or acts get at it easily, um, don't, don't pay people, you know, tens of thousands of dollars a year to do that. You can perhaps look at virtual assistants, you know, if it's not an easily found database, then find virtual assistants to scrape it off of LinkedIn or, um, you know, there's much cheaper ways, but you really want your salespeople doing sales things all day. You don't want them yeah. gathering data all day. And so that would be, you know, after that, there's obviously efficiency software around just, you know, email cadences and phoning people more quickly and things like that. And you, I'm not going to get into all that, but I'd yeah. say the biggest <laughs> mistake I think a lot of people make is they jump to process tools rather than just getting their data straightened out. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. So I think that is really valuable information and, and, a, and a great perspective. I would tend to agree with where they shouldn't be spending their time. Because it's, it's really about, I mean, ultimately about where are they, where are their skills most valuable? And when you can get other people to gather data, that's not necessarily where you want your salespeople. Absolutely. You can do it for well, so much cheaper. Um, right. And it's just fact, you know, I shouldn't say it's, it's not factory, right? it's just like, it's just the same thing over and over. So, yeah. um, you know, there, there's, and there's a lot of great people that do that way better than, than we would. So you have to train that sales, that salesperson to do essentially not sales stuff. It's kind of weird. Right. Yeah. Right. And do you, do you, is it your belief that any person with proper training can become a successful salesperson? I don't, I don't think so. Yeah. Um, and so one of those qualities and characteristics that I look for is called locus of control. And that's something uh, that I, so why I hire for these things, just to give you a bit more context on hiring is, is that I, I hire for things that I can't train. I, it's hard to train work ethic. It's hard to train curiosity. Yeah. It's hard to train locus of control. Locus of control is, um, essentially people either have an internal or an external locus of control. And, and there's probably folks that dabble in the middle of, as far as having a little bit of both, depending on the situation. But ultimately what it means is it, it was a, you know, behavioral, you know, term, I guess that was developed in the sixties or seventies, but essentially some portion of the world, I would say 60 to 70% of people in the world think things happen to them. Most of the time they believe in more luck. They believe in more fate. When something goes wrong, their first instinct is to look outwards and be external on what happened as far as things, you know, that was not my fault or here's why that happened and there's nothing I could do about it. Um, and then the other 30% are have an internal locus of control and essentially they, you know, in no better words, just own it. Everything that happens to them, they don't really believe in fate. They believe in they can control everything that happens around them. Um, their actions will dictate whatever path they're going to go down. When things happen to them, they tend to react completely differently in the sense that they look at that failure or that situation as an opportunity perhaps for learning because they own it, regardless of how it happened, you know, they own it. And so depending on the way you're raised, the way you're wired, the way, you know, you, you developed you're going to land in one of those two buckets. And I obviously want the people in sales that have an internal locus of control, because if you think about it, sales is a business or a, a job where failing 90% of the time is good. Yeah. Failing 95% <laughs> of the time is okay. Failing 98% of the time is bad. It's kind of like baseball, you know, like yeah, 30, you know, when you're like a 35% hitter, you're really, really good. Right. Um, so when you're dealing with that much failure, for someone to, you know, have an external look control where they essentially don't mm -hmm. believe anything is ever their fault or they, they, um, they don't know how to deal with that failure, they'll never learn, they'll never grow, yeah. they'll never get better because they just think there's nothing they can do to control their destiny. And so 
No, I don't believe everyone no. can be in sales because the, the, the role is so rooted in failure that you need to find people that are that like to grow from failure rather than look for reasons that the failure happened. I love that. I think that's spot on. Wow. I'm really glad that I asked that question. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> it really, really is great. So, um, so is there such a thing as like natural selling talent? Yeah, I think there's, you know, um, I think some people naturally can connect with others a little bit easier than others. Yeah. Um, and that's certainly a natural skill set that, you know, you can call that likability or rapport building or, but, it, you know, regardless, it still, I think, just comes back to curiosity. You know, I think it's all mm -hmm. under that bucket. Um you know, where people, you know, people that are curious actually genuinely care about other people and want to get to know yeah. them. And, and, and that's where most rapport building and likability come from. So, you know, I, th I think there is, people have had more exposure to that than others. You know, I, I, I was lucky or I'm like, whatever you want to call it, but from the ages of 14 to 18, my parents bought a bed and breakfast. So I would wake up every day to a new group of strangers in my house that I would get to know <laughs> you know and um so i love meeting new people i love meeting strangers whether it was i, I don't but i know it's because i basically grew up with strangers my whole life so right. um so that was just you know what conditioning i had that probably set me up to be more successful at sales than other people because i learned about getting to know people from scratch every day um and but that was just my upbringing so you know, can it be something that you train? It, it's tough. You know, it can be tough. I mean, you can tell people, you can give people tactics and tips to, you know, learn that skill, but um, it, it's tricky. So I think that's really one of the, you know, the main natural ones. Um, and, and I think another one that probably is a natural skill that people, you know, leverage is just, you know, it's again, in that realm is just building trust with people you know, that they have a lot of self-awareness and, um, you know, when they get into a conversation, they can tend to look at that conversation, not just through the lens of their own eyes, but perhaps from the lens of the other person, or even more powerfully from the lens of someone across the room, looking at them and that buyer talking to each other and looking at that conversation and, and, and sort of analyzing it and saying, is this, is this going right? Is this a trustworthy conversation? Does this person trust me? Um, and if not, what are the things that you're going to do in that conversation to, to start to build my trust by essentially, you know, and there's a bunch of ways you can do that. But I think those are natural tendencies that people have. Um, some people that are too focused on what they're saying rather than, you know, no understanding what the other, how the other person's receiving it is, you know, a, a natural talent that a lot of people have too. Yeah, I think those are, those are great points. And it's interesting that, that you share the story about the bed and breakfast. So when you were telling it, I was thinking when I was growing up, we moved every year to year and a half. So we always had to meet new people. Yep. You know, right when you got a best friend, my, you know, I just knew my dad was going to come home and say, well, we're moving. And, <laughs> and <laughs> we did. So my brother and sister and I were in this relative my sister and I more so than my brother because he's younger but we were in this constant state of well we just better lean into going to a new school and making new friends and walking yeah. around the neighborhood to see where the kids were kind of thing so it it's it does become a natural sort of thing to be curious about people and to have an ease of meeting people that a lot of other people don't necessarily have growing up, you know, it's not necessarily a thing. Absolutely. And I mean, just as you're saying it too, it, it also leads to having, you know, a good amount of self-confidence too, right? Because I'm sure when you yeah. go around the neighborhood and try to introduce yourself to a bunch of <laughs> kids and they tell you to screw off or <laughs> we're too cool for you, you know, you learn how to brush that off because you have yeah. to, right? Yeah. Um, so it's funny you bring that up because that that's another one of those key natural skills I think of, of just 
understanding that it's not you sometimes right. and it, it's okay rather than taking things too personally and, exactly uh, yeah. exactly that there's a good fit somewhere you just got to find it yeah 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 i i agree with you yeah it's it's, it's really it is fascinating um so is there if there was like one piece of advice I'm going to do two of these. If there was one piece of advice that you wanted to give to sales managers or small business owners about how they deal with their sales team once they have it, um, what do you think that would be? And then I have a follow-up. Um, I know it's tricky because I make you just do one, but it was, well, it, yeah, it was, kind of broad but i'll uh <laughs> i will uh i would say it's creating a culture of exposing weakness and ah, that's interesting um rather than creating a culture of bravado chest pumping douchebags let's call them <laughs> you know um, and so you know, making sure you have a team that's balanced, right, with with uh, men and women or people from different sexual orientation or whatever it is, but balanced so that it doesn't become this bravado, ego-based sales culture. Um, because essentially the culture of your team is what's going to be what is presented to your buyer and people don't like that person. Um and, and so when I say creating a culture of exposing weakness, what I, what I mean by that is getting you as a leader, being very comfortable talking about your flaws, talking about things you're not good at, you're not good at talking about things that you're learning, talking about and, and creating an environment where it's safe for your sellers to think and operate the same way. Because when they start thinking in that lens of, I don't know everything, I don't need to hide my flaws, I don't need to pretend that I'm good just so that I don't get fired, they start learning. Yeah. Uh, people don't get better if they're always pretending to be great. They mm -hmm. just pretend to be great all the time because that takes a ton of energy to do that. So if you want your team to get better, if you want them to learn, it starts with you creating an environment and a culture to be okay with your flaws and your weaknesses. But some ancillary things that start to happen about around that is that they start to communicate that way with their buyers. They start to talk about their product a little bit differently in the sense of, you know what, it doesn't do that. Oh, you know what? I don't know if I can help you with that. Mm -hmm. Why does that really matter? But all those things are amazingly great ways to build trust with buyers is because you're not just telling people all day long that your product's great. It's the best. You should buy it. You're actually trying to figure out with them whether it's the right fit or not. And people buy from those people. And those are, that's, that's a great way to build trust. Um, you can't, you're not going to buy from someone that tells you yes, 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 all day long, because you don't know if the yeses are real. You buy people from that say, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. Because then when the yeses come out, they're real. That's trust. So start with a culture of exposing weakness in yourself with your team and hopefully I'll proliferate across your team and then proliferate with your, your prospects. Oh, wow. That is fabulous. I love that. And it actually answered my second question because my second one was going to be, I mean, I think it did. So feel free to add <laughs> something. Um, but because my second question was, and what is one piece of advice you would give to actual sales reps? Um, but it felt like what I heard was, um be authentic be honest be uh really looking for the right fit um and being okay with not being that right fit yeah yeah absolutely i mean there's a couple of physiological things that i think about as a, as a, that i tell the early sellers that are that have a perception of sales just like everyone else that does out there that sales is a you know a head-to-head -head battle that you have to have with the buyer where you're you're trying to wrestle them down to the to the table and you know get them to and convince them i hate convince right them. i know me too <laughs> you know and, and uh, i just think convince is the, just a, a bad word it's a terrible word yeah and so you know physiologically you just need to move from 
the other side of the table that your buyer's on to the same side of the table. And, uh-huh. you know, rather than going back and forth and facing each other on that table, you should be looking at the problem side by side with them and saying, mm-hmm. okay, here's what you're saying. Your problem is here's what I've got as a solution. Well, let's work through this together. And then let's see if this is a fit. Most people fail in sales because they only hunt for yeses. And what you get when you hunt for yeses all day long is you get a ton of maybe. Deals die in maybe. Buyers don't buy and they don't, you know, when they don't buy, they rarely say no. Um, Especially up in Canada, by the way, I don't know if you know that. I love selling the States way more than in Canada because we're too polite and indirect up here. So we we hate saying no to salespeople. (laughs) Um, But that sucks, you know, because you basically never know where the deal's at. Right. Um, Right. So great salespeople are hunting for yeses and nos all day long. They don't care actually which one they get. They just yeah. want yeses and nos. Um, the, you know, the, 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 the concept behind the theory behind this is that people don't buy rarely because they're buying something else. There's rarely a situation, you know, most of the time they don't buy because it's just, they don't make a decision. Yeah. It's not a priority more or whatever it is. So if your biggest competitor is buyers not making a decision, all you should be selling is a process to make a decision Ah. and and not your product. Who cares if, who cares if they buy your product or not? You should just be working on selling a process to get to a point where that person can say yes or no. I don't care which one at the end of it. And if you operate with that mentality where you were just going down this path, and if you want to go down this path with me at any point, you can say, no, it's totally cool. Obviously, I'm a salesperson. I want you to say yes. That's my job. But if you say no, cool, we'll part ways. What I don't want is maybes. And I think a lot of junior salespeople are trained to just get yeses. And when you get all, when you're hunting for yeses all day long, you get a lot of maybes and you fail. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I completely agree with that. That's great. That, that is great. Uh, It, because it goes along with the curiosity thing as well, that your people, you can't convince, you can't really sell something. People will buy from you when they have the need, when they trust you, when, you know, all the stars align. So your job is to learn whether there is that opportunity there. And it, and it's, oftentimes it's not going to be there. It, it could be that you could provide the solution, but you don't want to because they're jerks. Yeah. So, right. You just being curious is a whole other mindset from looking for those yeses, seeking those yeses. It just totally changes the dynamic. You got it. Yeah. Yeah. Love that. Carly, I love this conversation. I really appreciate the the mindset, the thought process. I am in total sync with you on that whole thing. And I'm so grateful that you shared it with my listeners because I really think it's a valuable thing for them to learn. So thank you for doing that. You're welcome. And thank you for having me. It was just great getting to know you and um, hopefully I could be helpful in some way or another. Absolutely. So will you let the listeners know um, what Circle is and how they can find you and all that other great stuff, please? Yeah, for sure. So I, I you know, to solve that stigma and uh, the problem around education, I started SDR Nation. It's a community for junior sales reps to get coaching from experts and courses and content and, and events from experts. Um, specifically, it happens, it helps a lot for small business because you might not have a sales leader, but you need to hire a salesperson. So we kind of act as that virtual sales leader for your team. Um, so that's one of the, the businesses I have, but I just started a company called Circle. Uh, Circle is a leading platform for, for brands and creators um, that are looking to get closer to their customers. Um, and, and in doing so by building a community. So I built a community for SDR Nation is what, when I got sort of involved in the whole community space. And then this whole creator economy started to take off where um, folks like yourself, you know, um, and uh, uh, Diane and, and a lot of other, you know, bigger and smaller brands and, and small businesses that maybe provide coaching services or accounting services or what have you are building a community as part of their website so that their customers can engage with each other 
um, learn, you know, perhaps through courses or different types of content mediums, um, have little ask me anything sessions. And uh, so I started for a circle about two weeks ago as the head of sales. So you can find me at uh, Charlie Locke, just if you search that on LinkedIn uh, or charlie at circle.co. Writing that down. Terrific. Well, thank you so much for this, as I said, and I'll make sure that uh, that uh, information for getting in touch with you is in the show notes so that people can have that. And, um, you know, listeners, thank you. Uh, you are who we're doing this for. This was some really fabulous information and takeaways for you to probably listen to this maybe a couple of times so that you can really absorb the information that Charlie was uh, sharing with us. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Accelerate Your Business Growth, a production of Evergreen Podcasts. Discover more episodes of this podcast and explore others at evergreenpodcast.com. As always, continue to prosper and be curious. And if you're looking to get your sales strategy headed in the right direction, pick up a copy of Succeed Without Selling on Amazon or wherever books are sold. Until we meet again on another episode of Accelerate Your Business Growth, goodbye and good day. Hey, podcast listeners. My name is Paul O'Connor, and I'm the host of the Rust Belt Rundown, a show that highlights valuable insights from manufacturing executives and business leaders in Northeast Ohio and beyond. We convene these leaders for candid discussions about business, regional happenings, industry trends, entrepreneurship, and more. With a wide range of guests and topics, there is something for everyone. Listen to Rust Belt Rundown for free on Spotify, Apple, or your favorite podcast app.